So now I'd like to introduce Peter Jones, who is a member of the Beaver Clan of the Onondaga Nation. He's one of the most recognized and accomplished Iroquois artists working today. His 45-year career has been achieved and maintained by the mastery of his medium and the establishment of a solid body of work in clay. By studying traditional techniques developed over time by ancient civilizations, including his own Iroquois culture, Jones is one of several artists responsible for reinvigorating, reactivating, and mentoring a distinct traditional pottery practice among the Haudenosaunee. Peter has shown his work in numerous exhibitions, including the Eversons 2010 show, Haudenosaunee Elements, and recent solo show in 2012. And the museum recently acquired a group of work by Peter, one of which is um, in the ceramic collection, and it looks like we have some examples to look at of Peter's work too. So please join me in welcoming Peter B. Jones. Well, she gave you most of my background. I grew up on the Cattaraugus Indian Reservation over near Buffalo. And when I was 15, I left for the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, which at the time was an all Indian art high school. And uh, that's where I, I learned ceramics and pottery. Um, I've been doing that ever since. And uh, I've been fortunate enough to make a living at it without uh, having to do too much outside work, <laughs> real work, as people say. And uh, I was learning to throw, and I was combining throwing methods with uh, slab built methods, and, and did this head, which is kind of strange because I'm doing more heads now, but uh, it's part of my work. So it started out with these, and now I'm ending up with them again. This was a piece that I did in 1964, I think, 64, 65. It's called Red Paint. It's been used and shown all over the place. Um, it was during the pop art um, period. I did it to uh, signify how being an instant Indian. This was done during the uh, hippie period, hippie times, and a lot of the hippie people were emulating us and thinking they could be instant Indians, so that's what this was about. This was a, uh, I call this a landscape series. It's wheel thrown and slab construction. It's about almost three feet tall. And I use elements from uh, the landscape of New Mexico where I was living at the time. The word Mexico actually came off, and the number one came off of the telephone pole uh, marker. It's called Emergence. It depicts the story of the original people when they uh, came out of the earth. The Seneca story is at Bear Mountain near Canandaigua, where the original people emerged out of a cave. There's very only three emergence um, creation stories that I know of. Most people think of um, Sky Woman as being the creation story for Seneca and Iroquois in general, but they also have this one about the uh, Bear Hill. And the Apaches also have one that's similar in the Hopi back to Sipapu, which is very similar to the people coming out of the middle of the earth. Now, this is an effigy pot, which is the style of pottery that we made in the <coughs> 1400s, 1300s to the 1500s. And, um, Consequently, died out because of the introduction of iron kettles, copper kettles. And uh, when I was in school, I learned a little bit about it. And then when I came home in '77, I started to research Iroquois pottery and, and found there wasn't really a whole lot written about it. So I ended up going from museum to museum and uh, looking at their collections of Iroquois pottery. 
and started developing my own uh, style. The pot that's on the table is taken from the same style, the rounded bottom, the pointed bottom, and the constricted neck, the high collar, and then the effigies around the top. This is more modern in that it's glazed, stoneware, it's high fire, but the, the uh, elements are all the same. This piece represents the uh, cosmos. A lot of our stories are about uh, the sky and the universe. So that's what this is. It has rawhide uh, attachments on it to represent um, lightning or different things. And it has elements of uh, design that were used in uh, traditional pottery. And the white shell represents stars. This one's called White Dog Beast, and it represents uh, a period when we actually did sacrifice a white dog during this time of year for winter. And uh, it has a bone carving of a, a dog on the top attached with a uh, rawhide. What is the story of that, the white dog? What is the it was raised as a pure dog, and it was sacrificed uh, to bring good luck and a good year. It was uh, a ceremony that they still do today, but the part with the dog has been left out <laughs> because of that you know, uh, cruelty to animals. But they still do carry it on. So they would substitute a basket for the dog. That one, this one is a fairly recent piece. It also contains the uh, same elements as the other traditional Iroquois pottery, but this one is called 9-11 pot. I made it after the 9-11 uh, Twin Towers bomb. And the effigies on it are two airplanes, and then I borrowed the uh, image of the screaming man. And then the pit fire created the clouds that you see in the body of the pot. It reminds me a lot of uh, the images that they showed over and over again on television, where the clouds were billowing up and people were wandering through. Uh, just in disbelief. This piece is in the uh, National Museum of American Indian Collection. And it will be being shown at the new uh, 9-11 Museum, Memorial Museum, that's opening this spring. Mm -hmm. Next one. This one is from an American series that I did. It's what's called American Holocaust. It represents Chief Bigfoot when he was uh, died in a massacre. He actually was shot and didn't die from his wounds. He died uh, from freezing to death. <laughs> This is a very small piece, it's only about 12 inches. That is, uh, the people that donated to the museum here own that one. This is another one, the same uh, pose as the uh, Bigfoot one. This is called American Tragedy. And it depicts a, a, a person with a bottle of alcohol. And I wanted to give it a little leeway there so you really can't tell if he's going down or getting up. <laughs> this one's called Entrepreneur or Lost Indian from the Fogawi tribe, which is another story. He has a, a gasoline nozzle in his hand, a headdress on looking for customers. On the back of his head is a slot for a piggy bank. <laughs> this one's called um, uh, World on the Turtle's Back. It has a TV screen on it where the
story of Sky Woman is Queen, which is the way that most of our kids these days get their information. Most of our people, I would say. Um, as the airplane crashing into the top, um, backside of the uh, slot machine, Statue of Liberty on the other side, it's just holding a tablet and it just says no on there to reference how they used to, they used to be something for people to see the Statue of Liberty and knowing that they were uh, welcome to this country. And current, current times, they're not letting in people. So she has no on her tablet now. Uh, on the ground or on the back of the turtle, we have people that are caught up underneath all this, which is us or you. And then different symbols on there like radiation and oil well drilling and things that are going on in the, the world today. The turtle always represents the world, uh, Iroquois world. This one is called Blood Quantum. It talks about how much percentage of blood we are. Um, they go by the mother in some societies, our society, matrilineal. If your mother is, is Indian, then you're Indian. Other tribes go by blood quantum. If your mother is Indian, your father's not Indian, and so on and so forth. So he's got a little sign on the bottom that says one quarter, half, three quarters, <laughs> full. Um, and, uh, it's a problem that's presenting itself even more today with the um, casinos, particularly where they have to divvy up the money and profits from casinos. And the less people there are uh, in the tribe, the, the more tribe is. So they're sort of screening out a lot of people. I did that piece go back in 97. This one I did in 1990. It's called uh, Sovereign Indian. And his hands are bound, tied to his body, because uh, we are only as sovereign as Congress allows us to be. Uh, if they want to declare us not sovereign, they can. That's what that was for. This was from the 500 year celebration. Indigenous. It's just a bunch of um, images on his face, words, letters, binary code. The next slide, too. It's the front. And it says a little bit about extinction, the X on his forehead, our moving, uh, being integrated into the, the larger society, little by little. We were supposed to be gone by now. <laughs> I mean, we were declared extinct way really, back, but we refused to believe it. Now, this one is about gambling, and I did this one in 98. Six. When all the it was ninety-six, ninety-three. When there was a lot of uh, talk about building the casinos in New York State and uh, the effects that they would have on on uh, everyone, not just the Indians, but this this one is in particular about the Indians and on the three sisters on the screen there comes up corn beans and squash. Uh, one arm bandit handle is a horn rattle. These gas nozzles for horns, which horns represent chiefs in our society. He has gas nozzles. And the gastoa or headdress he is wearing is usually made of feathers. This one's made out of dollar bills. Hmm. And then the other side of the coin. This one here? No, the next one, that one. It's the other side of the same sculpture. Comes up all dollar bills. 
This piece is in a collection in Germany. This one's called Dialogue on Sovereignty. Um, <laughs> when the uh, federal government or even the state government gets together with Indians to talk about our sovereignty, that's usually what happens. We're back to back Oops. talking but not listening. We're just not even talking at each other. But they're wrapped up in the, uh, on this side, the uh, George Washington Covenant Belt, which was one of the first peace treaties. And then on top of that, the blue and white represents the two row wampum, which was a treaty that uh, stated that the two would sub subsist or live together uh, peacefully and never, never interfere with each other. But on the next slide, I think is the other side. The American flag is on the bottom because the two treaties, two row wampum and George Washington, Covenant Bell precede the, the American flag. And they are also <coughs> above it in um, precedence or setting rules and laws that are supposed to be adhered to by the uh, federal government. It's an agreement that we made with the federal government. This is a piece called uh, Indian with Baggage. <laughs> Double on top. On his bags, he has different um, stickers and things from different uh, encounters we've had, like Wounded Knee, the BIA, uh, different things that are going on, went on. But the baggage he's carrying is, is the American flag, which represents the American government. Uh, cigarettes, which is still a thing. Alcohol and the beer can. And that's his personal baggage. This one is called Totodaho. Totodaho is the head chief of the Iroquois Confederacy. <coughs> it was a twisted man when they met him to try to get him to join. And they combed the snakes from his hair and he became the leader because they knew if they got him to join, the other tribes would fall in. And uh, this is a modern Totodaho. His problems are the gasoline nozzles, once again. Uh, he's got a dollar sign necklace and a cigarette necklace. This piece was done uh, in reference to what was happening on the Onondaga Reservation when they bulldozed the gas stations and got rid of all the, the uh, individual owners of the businesses. This one's called Street Chief. It represents uh, our people that are homeless. It's, it's, a, it's a strange thing that an American Indian to be homeless in America, but they are. A number of them are veterans who are for one reason or another, don't fit into society anymore, so they take to the streets. On the side of him, the thing there on his hip is a uh, brown bag with a bottle in it. And they usually just sit around all day just either panhandling or just going from day to day. But they all have stories to tell. They all have something interesting to, to talk about. They've seen it all. This one is called Red Moon. <coughs> represents uh, the moon and it's a uh, fold of the red is the blood. It represents a different cycle, the women's cycle. This has a lot of uh, celestial meaning to it. It's called New India. This is in the collection at Colgate. 
It's uh, Indian with the headdress that has morphed into a, a cone shape. And he has, instead of the antlers to depict the chi, he has three button buck antlers coming out. And uh, also part of his uh, regalia is an iPod. <laughs> <laughs> The, the iPod and technology is all invasive. <laughs> it's captured all of us. This is from a prophecy show that opened here um, a couple years ago. And uh, it, the show was about the guy we are. The good word, the quote of Handsome Lake, and uh, what he prophesied was going to happen in the end times. And the show opened then, um, when was that? I can't remember. Oh. When the end times were. <laughs> yeah, the end times were. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. December. Yeah, so I, that's when I did this series. Uh, this is, uh, represents um, the sickness. It'll be a sickness and no one can cure it. And it's going to take over everyone. That's what this one is, yellow man. And then the next one. And the prophecy is saying there will be two orbs that appear in the eastern sky, one red, one yellow. And if e either one of them touches the ground and breaks, that will signify the end of the world. Now, now they say that the red represents blood, the white represents, I mean, the yellow represents um, bile. But uh, that's, that's one of the prophecies that's in there. There's 140 some different things. The next one. Now these are faces of the uh, true believers. And the prophecy, they say that if you're a true believer, You'll go to sleep and you'll be spared all of the Holocaust that is to come. You'll die peacefully. So that's what this, this piece represents. These are wanderers in the prophecy. They talk about people not having any direction. They'll just be wandering directionlessly and totally confused. These days I could put an iPod in there. <laughs> See how they're wandering today. Uh, aimlessly. Now uh, this one is um, a newer one. I just did this this year, well, whatever the year it is. Between fall and now. And uh, <coughs> It's another 9-11 piece. It's called Post-9-11. On the top we have a uh, nuclear reactor chimney, binary code around the bottom. The globe on top of his head represents the world. It says chatter on it. It has drones and airplanes flying over it. And uh, on the things hanging down here, he has, I have bone beads that were made out of buffalo bone that I carved in the shape of bombs. The face is all bullet ridden. That represents the, uh, the images we saw on television where they captured Gaddafi and all of those things happened since post 9, since 9-11. Uh, and that's what this represents. This piece was purchased by the 9-11 uh, Memorial Museum and will be in the show this spring when they open. They like it because everything they have is 9-11 related and nothing post 9-11. It's like what happened afterwards. And the next one is just another view of it. Twenty-seven inches. I 
you it wouldn't be um, purchased by any individual because it's kind of hard to live with. And I was glad that a museum bought <laughs> because it's where it should be. I started a series of these large pots uh, this past year. And I call them story pots, and they have different uh, stories, legends, myths, creation stories. There's the green one here. Sky Woman Pod. Next two are the same pod. Yeah, it's the same one on the other side. Next one. So that you pop with four different uh, figures on it. The next one. Same pop. Next one. Next one. Yeah. This one I had in the prophecy show. This one I started the series actually. This one was uh, Called the underworld pot because at the end times everything that's in the ground is going to come out of the ground. Uh, <coughs> animals, critters, strange things. The bumps on the pots represent the uh, things trying to get out of the earth. It's the same on this pot here. They're all about the same size as this one. Yes? To the markings, the scoring on the collar, I have. Um, like an or Most Iroquois pots have that type, they call it plating. It's a geometric design that you right. find on the collar. No one really knows what they meant um, because we lost, uh, we stopped making pottery in the 1500s. So, like I said, there wasn't much written about it either. But it was on the old pots too. It's on all, almost all the old pots. This is called Frank in India, part of the uh, series of heads I've been doing. <laughs> kind of a composite Indian. This one's in a private collection. I think that's it. Any questions? Yes, um, I noticed on the piece that the new piece we have of yours, there is um, the same effect on the head, on the top. The yes. Um, what is that material, and is there any um, significance? Look, I haven't seen the piece you're talking about, but I think, is it the shiny ball or shiny glow? Oh, it's the two oh, years. The it's the ball, the generation. Oh, 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 okay. Yeah. Well, rawhide is one of the things we use a lot of. And, uh, different uh, crafts, parts and crafts. And I like it because it can, it can form it and uh, it stays and maintains its shape. It's also very um, durable. But I like, it gives the whole pot or sculpture another dimension by using it. And then I have beads and different things incorporated into that. Um, I used to use feathers and things, but feathers decay over time. Rawhide was a better choice. On the, excuse me, on the same piece, uh, there's something in the figure's hand, and you can figure out what it is that is being out. Generations. Generations. Oh, uh, that's a horn. Yeah, horn rail. Horn rail. Horn rail. Horn rail. Horn rail. Horn rail. Horn. 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 You take a uh, you take a cow horn and you cut it off, and then you put a handle on it and put your uh, either pebbles or seeds in there and it makes a it's like a baby rattle. Um, the, the tours that we've given and which we've been able to um, look with the kids around this piece and really uh, around generations, excuse me, um, they're crazy about it. They know about it. Yeah. They can tell you absolutely everything. And this is the grandma, this is the great, great, great. 
Uh, that's, that's great. Uh, that's what I like to hear. People can identify with it, not necessarily because it's Indian, but they can identify with it because it's, uh, it's something that they, they're familiar with, whether they know it or not. <laughs> contacted me to see if I knew any Mohawks that had any any steel workers, iron workers, that had any memorabilia from the building when they put it up. And uh, that's how I got in touch with uh, the curator. And I told her I was working on something, sent her a picture, and that was what happened. She had the other piece already selected from the uh, National Museum collection. So she she knew who I was before. Were there any Mohawks or other high skill people from the nations involved in the buildings? Oh yeah, yeah. They were involved in putting up the old building. They were involved in taking it down because after it was um, demolished. They were familiar with how it was built, so they came down to take it apart. And, uh, but unfortunately, um, health issues were a problem. Mm -hmm. They didn't know the severity of the, um, the atmosphere that was created from the bombing. It was just a lot of poison in the air, and consequently, a lot of the iron workers suffered from myasthenia. Uh, this lung disease, all different, not just the iron workers, the first responders too. But they didn't have the mask. They should have had a class A respirator, and now they had those little clock things. I'm interested in learning more about the old pots. Mm -hmm. Are there many available to be seen, and where would they be? Rochester Museum has probably the best collection of uh, the, the old pots. Is that the memorial? Yeah, no, not the memorial. Rochester Museum of Science. Oh, yeah. But, all you guys, <laughs> we're trying to do a pottery show here, Iroquois pottery show. It'll be the first time ever. Uh, we have uh, about 30 potters who are doing a traditional style or tr traditional based Iroquois pot style. So we're trying to put together a show to be exhibited here, opening here. Back in the 60s, this used to be the site of the International Ceramic Show. And uh, that's where the collection comes from. And I thought it would be appropriate to have an Iroquois pottery show. As a, because it is a rebirth of the pottery that started in the uh, 60s and 70s. And, uh, started off with maybe five or six people, now we have 30. So, something to think about. Yep. Can you address generations and tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, that was um, Stephen Kern likes pottery, and somebody else liked sculpture. So we put it together. <laughs> <laughs> they wanted something for the museum. And uh, I, I did generations because it reflects uh, who I am, for one, and where we are in today's world. And we still carry on with, with the horn rattle that you see. We still carry on the songs of our generations. And that's what the people around me, the whole piece that represent. This is the continuity of our people. Yeah. Can I ask a question about your creative process? Um, how final is your image in your head when you start as compared to what finally ends when you say I'm done? I could have an image in my head rolling around for three or four years and finally get to it. 
um, all that time I'm just working out details, little logistics. But once I start on it, um, I just go until I'm finished. I, I rarely start something and stop and pick it up later. I usually do it, go straight through. It, to me, it, it preserves the uh, continuity of the medium. It's very, uh, working with clay, you have to work a little bit fast. You can cover it up and preserve it and make it, you know, so it doesn't dry out. But to me, it, it, it creates a spontaneity that you can't get otherwise. And so, a lot of times I'll do sketches, but usually they're just so, uh, to re so I'll remember right? what I, an idea I had. When it comes time to do the idea, I probably can't find the sketch. <laughs> but once you draw it, it's there. It's in your head somewhere. So I have a lot of sketchbooks, and I go back over some of them and, and recreate them now. And some of them, when I did the sketches, I didn't have the expertise to execute them. And it was like 20 years, 30 years, or even when I was a student. To me, it's interesting that they are still valid images. They're still uh, viable. And that's what that's what I aim for. Anything else? Any other questions? Indians, cowboys? Yes. <laughs> One question. You use the word Indian a lot. Do you yeah. ever get grief from an audience? Um, I grew up as an Indian. I, I don't know. Um, it's semantics. I am, I am. I, my dad was an Indian, my mother was an Indian. <laughs> you know? I do, yeah, people say, well, I want to just say Native American. It's just semantics. If you know who you are, it doesn't matter. Anything else? Yeah. Oh, it's kind of a silly question, but I was just out in Santa Fe, and it's so beautiful. Did you have a hard time leaving there? And coming <laughs> <out>? <laughs> I haven't left yet. <laughs> <laughs> I go back here at least once a year. Oh, okay. uh, yes, it's incredible, the scenery. See, when I went there, I thought I was in the middle of the desert mm -hmm. when I first went there. Mm -hmm. But I stayed there. <laughs> The, it is just, yeah, the light is different, the yeah. people are different, Everything, the whole pace of life is different. Could you say a couple of things about traditional firing? Yeah. Okay, okay we're, um, I'm in the process of developing a, a method of traditional firing, and I've been working on it for like 20 some years. I end up with more questions about it than, than answers. As you look at some of the pots, and they are uh, clean on the outside, but the inside is totally black. I've tried to duplicate that thing, um, that result, and that's what I'm working for. Uh, most of our pottery was fired between 900 to 1200 degrees. Uh, the composition of the clay was either uh, found clay with crushed shell or uh, crushed pottery as an addition to give it what they call body so that you can work with it. Um, they were coil built, paddled, and then um, designed on the collars or wherever. And uh, to fire them you have to, well this is true of all clay. Clay isn't dry until it's around 750 degrees. You can have a pot sitting around the house, unfired, for 20 years, and it still has water content. Because it's porous, it absorbs any atmospheric water. So, keep that in mind when you put it in the pit fire, which is hard to control. If the flames or fire gets too hot, too fast, that water that's left in there turns to steam and blows it up. So, the trick is to fire it slowly, and I found out that if you use, start with softwoods and build a fire up with softwoods, because softwoods only burn at 
500 degrees or so. Then you start to proceed to build a fire hotter and hotter, up into a maple or a oak, where you can get up to 1,200 degrees in an open fire. And that's what, uh, what makes the pots durable. They're not real durable, but they're durable. <laughs> and is that fire pit a singular volume, or are there levels of it for different heat? There's different heat. Uh, any fire is different. Um, you can't control it, especially an open pit fire. That's why kilns were in advance over bonfire firing, pit firing. They contained the heat, they could regulate them, it took less fuel to make it 9, uh, 11, 1200 degrees. So, so in your fire pit, would you have just one layer of pots? Or would you try to fire various levels? Uh, I usually do one layer. Um, all in the thing and then I protect them with either stones or large clay shards, uh, kiln shelves, just leaning up against and build a fire on the outside of it so that the fuel can't touch the pot. If the fuel touches the pot, it creates a hot spot and that'll blow it out. It's a tricky process, but I've got it down to where most of the firings are 90% productive. And how many hours? Uh, not very. Three at the most. Depending on how many pots you have. Yeah. Who are some of your uh, influences in, and or favorite artists and movements in the history of art? That includes your uh, clay book. Mm -hmm. well, one of my favorite people just passed away was um, Dal Cushing. He influenced me because we worked together when I was still in, uh, just out of high school. And, uh, Who's that? Dal Cushing and Alfred. And uh, he was one of my best tutors in clay. And, uh, I was also, uh, I like Bob Arnson's work. Funk artist, funk ceramics. Um, Alan Hauser for Native American ceram uh, sculpture. Uh, big fan of Salvador Dali. Uh, Giacometti. I like his Walking Man. It was one of the first pieces I saw in grade school at the Albright Knox. And. Uh, uh, there's such a, just a lot of people that uh, have influenced me. Picasso, when he was working at Belarus for ceramics, did a number of ceramic pieces there. He also incorporated a lot of um, Native American aspects to his work. Um, I don't know, just Tom Huff. <laughs> <laughs> Adelie Loloma was the, a Hopi teacher who was at the Institute when I first went there. And she was probably the, the most influential. She taught me one thing, and that was to love the clay and respect it. Um, I've since found out or learned that clay starts out as a living thing. It's, it's made out of carbonaceous material. So it does have a memory. When you work with it, especially if you're making a teapot or a bottle shape, you turn it this way. When it's a little too dry, it wants to go back the other way. That's, uh, when you make a teapot spout, you have to cut it at a certain angle so when it's fired, it goes back the way you want it to. If you're pugging clay in a pug mill and you just cut it off and throw it on the wheel where it was corkscrewed through the pug mill, will create a spiral in the bottom of your pond, a spiral crack. So all of these things are part of what clay is. And that was one of the, the most important things I had to learn. I'm teaching now, and I'm running into all that again. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's interesting and refreshing my mind. Now, 
Did you spend some time in Montana? Yeah, I was at the Archie Bray Foundation. This was uh, Val Cushing and I were, I had a full scholarship to Alfred University in New York College of Ceramics. And I went there after my high school senior. And went there as a freshman. And Val Cushing was one of my teachers. I could not stand the atmosphere at uh, Alfred. I had been working the previous four, five, three years as an independent artist selling my pottery. And going into Alfred at that time, you had to sit there and throw cylinders and you know, the basics. I just couldn't do it. I couldn't handle it. So I left. And two years later, I ended up on a scholarship to the Archie Bray Foundation in Montana. Lo and behold, so did uh, Val Cushing. <laughs> so we spent the whole summer working together. And it was really great. He, he never thought he'd see me again after I dropped. And we remained friends forever. But the Archie Bray Foundation was a, a brick factory in Montana, in Helena. And the owner of the brick factory liked pottery. And so he wanted, as his legacy, to create the Archie Bray Foundation, which was a place for potters to go. And the first, one of the first potters there was Peter Borkos. And, um, I cannot think of the other guy's name. He's got some work in his collection here. I was there at the same time as Peter of course. He does a lot of raku. Uh, he taught at Colorado. It's coming, it's coming. <laughs> but anyway, uh, they were the, the founding uh, potters at Archie Bray in the 50s, late 50s. And I was there in 66. Somewhere around there. That was that was an, an experience. I, I learned more at that place probably in that one summer. I probably learned more than I did the previous three years at school. There were so many uh, top potters that came through, and just everybody had uh, critiques, and, you know, ideas and hints on how to do this and that. It's just great. Any other questions? Yeah. It sounds like your talent was recognized at a pretty young age. And I was just curious about how that first happened, how you knew you were an artist, you know? how that was encouraged. When I was a kid, I had uh, a neighbors down at the end of the street had uh, <laughs> word <in> Roswell. <laughs> Neighbors at the end of the street had, um, were teachers in Buffalo, grade school teachers, and they would bring me clay, and um, I would make things and give it to them, and then they would take them back to school and fire them. So, and then I was at school here in um, at Onondaga for six months, and I, I made stuff at the, the grade school there. Yeah, I started very young, but I never thought I'd make a living at it. I actually went to the Institute in Santa Fe to study, um, what do you call that? The precursor to computer graphics back then, in the 60s. Commercial art. Commercial art. I actually went to, to that school to study that. Didn't like the teacher, liked the ceramics teacher. Ended up in ceramics. We had to take, at that time, the school, when you first start there, you had to take a class in each department that they offered so you could find your, your space. And I ended up in ceramics after all that. Anything else?